Check. I can do the intro. Okay. Fine. I mean, um, you did so much work to put this together. I feel like you, you deserve to have your moment in the spotlight. Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, there will be more people rolling in because I think we'll actually run out of space at some point in time. But there's some additional um, chairs and just yeah, pull one to the to the table. I guess yeah, for the you guys that are coming, just tell them um, get a chair and and try to um, sit somewhere. Thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> we'll spread the day in uh, about one hour sessions each. Um, each session will start yeah. with a short presentation followed by live uh, coding, which will do the exercise that you're supposed to do afterwards. And then you'll have time to follow up with the same thing that we're going to do in front of you guys. Um, throughout the day, we're going to make a small app that searches the public API and shows them a list of businesses. Um, it's all written in Kotlin. Um, the first exercise is actually to set everything up, so don't worry. Um, at the end of the presentation, when you go through um, the workbook, this is the link to the workbook. Um, at the end of it, on the end of the first section, is basically the commands you need to follow in order to um, get up to speed and see what you're going to see presented. Um, the whole thing is going to be hosted by me, Maltz, and Kurt. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt us during the presentation. We'll answer them during the presentation. Um, also, if you uh, have a question, both microphones are, um, are there, so just walk up to a microphone. The whole thing is going to be live streamed as well because there's a few um, out of office uh, people that are remote actually employees that wanted to also follow up. So if you have a question, it's going to be nice. Just raise your hand. I'll either come with a microphone to you guys or um, you can walk up to a microphone, um, interrupt us. And during the live coding, um, we'll also be available for help. So if you're stuck with something, I don't know, Git is crashing on you, you can't clone the repo or whatever, um, just raise your hand. One of us will come to you and help you out. Um, or you just have a question for anything. It doesn't have to be like a technical problem. You just want to have something, some more clarity on things. Just um, raise your hand. One of us will come to you and, and help you out. Um, and with that, I'm just going to end it off to Miles for the first one. Have fun. Is my mic on? Is my mic on? Yes, my microphone is on. Uh, I don't know where I should stand. This feels kind of weird. I'll stand right here and paste between these two screens. Uh, does this work for everyone? Can everyone see a screen? Raise your hand if you can't see a screen. Perfect. Flawless. Uh, so yeah, for those of you who don't know me, hello. My name is Jonathan Maltz. Uh, I go by Maltz around here because it turns out there are a lot of other Johns and Jonathan uh, floating around. I work on the CAM team, which means I work on Bunsen. Uh, so if you hear that and you ever have questions about that or for some reason you're using the data warehouse, uh, you can come and talk to me in Pound Consumer Analytics. Uh, but today we're not going to talk about anything Bunsen related, nor will we talk about a data warehouse. We're going to talk about Kotlin. Uh, and so specifically, we're going to talk about sort of uh, this first presentation is going to focus on the syntax of the language, some of the high-level constructs, some similarities with Java, some differences with Java. Uh, if you've been coming to Android school regularly, which you all should be doing, because uh, Sanai and I help curate it, uh, you've, uh, some of this will seem familiar to you. But if this is brand new, uh, this will be an introduction to why, what Kotlin looks like and what all those fancy symbols mean that are different than Java. Quick. Bam. Uh, so the first thing to understand about Kotlin is that in Kotlin land, the idea of primitives goes away. Uh, so now you no longer have your primitive ints, your primitive booleans, chars, shorts, etc. Instead, everything is a type. And this will give us a lot of benefits as we go on through some areas of the presentation, specifically uh, when we talk about functions. Uh, but what this means is, in practice, you'll be using capital B boolean, capital I integer, uh, capital L long, anywhere that you would have used a lowercase l or, or lowercase version of that in Java land. Uh, it also means that for interoperability, so one of the good things about Kotlin is that you can work directly with Java code from Kotlin and Kotlin code from Java. Uh, it means that the Java types int, int and integer, so both the primitive and the object version, are going to get boxed up into this int class when you go into Kotlin. Uh, and similarly, when you go down, uh, when you come out of that, uh, you're going to need to be a little bit mindful of that. Uh, some things that are different about Kotlin land are the concept of void gets a little bit overloaded here. So for interoperability, both the type unit and the type nothing uh, become a void type, but those two types have different meaning in Kotlin. Uh, the type unit maps pretty closely onto the concept of void. Uh, so it is the subclass, or no, it is not the subclass of, every, of everything. Uh, it is when you are not returning anything from a method. Uh, so you're just sort of changing some state on an object or performing some sort of action. Uh, the type there is going to be any or unit. Uh, at the same time, there's also the nothing type. The nothing type is a return type for a method that says it is impossible for this method to actually return. 
so if your method is always going to be throwing an exception, then the return type of that method would be nothing. There's also the type any, which maps onto the object type in Java, which is to say that everything in Kotlin is a subtype of the any type. Uh, the last thing to keep in mind is the collections syntax. Uh, so for arrays, uh, by default, what you're going to have is everything in Kotlin, you're going to be able to do array of my type. So you can have an array of any, an array of business objects, and you can also have an array of capital I int. Uh, what that means when it gets converted over into Java code is that that is going to be an integer array. Now, the difference is if you want a primitive array of something, then what you're going to do is you're going to have to create the specific int array object in order to get those primitive types uh, when you go back into Java land. Uh, in terms of packaging and imports of things, uh, a lot of this will be pretty similar to Java land. So a couple of things that are different is we continue to have packages. We continue to be able to import things. Uh, one thing that has changed is that no longer do you need to do static imports of things. So if you have a constant, such as the, in this case the view.visible constant that exists in the view class, you can just import that just like everything else. Uh, the other thing that we'll talk a little bit more about later is this idea of type aliases. This is something if you use uh, Python and you're used to doing like import x from whatever and then calling it something else, uh, you're, it will seem very familiar to you. Basically what you're doing here is you're, you're taking a type and giving it a special name just for the purposes of this class. Uh, this can be really handy in the case where you're importing something to things called view, uh, such as you might have done in our MVP architecture, and you don't want to use the fully qualified name in half of the places. So with this code that we have here, what we can do is we can then reference this C view wherever we want to use the contract view, and that will mean that we don't need to have that, that full name everywhere we go. Uh, when it comes to variables, variables are very, uh, many of the concepts are very similar between Java, but some of the words are different. Uh, as we talk about Kotlin, and for those of you who have seen some things about the language, you'll see that one of the things that Kotlin really puts an emphasis on is this idea of conciseness. Uh, and so that, that starts with the way that variables are typed, or the way that variables are described, and their, out, and their, uh, n their mutability is described. Uh, so the two things in particular for this presentation, Gash, is your, oh, I wasn't sure if Gash's microphone was off. Uh, so the two, the two things to get started we're going to talk about uh, are just the, the concept of val versus var, and also the concept of type inference. Both of these are things which uh, are, very, are very similar, exist in Java, but make it are a little bit nicer and more concise in Kotlin land. There we go. Uh, so the first thing is the, the concept of val versus var. Uh, vars are basically your standard issue variables in uh, Java land. So vars can be changed whenever you want, and they can be updated, and you can update them and do anything that you normally would if you were to just declare a variable. Uh, in Java land. Uh, the difference is that the val keyword is effectively the equivalent of adding final in front of your, your variable in Java land. Uh, so this means that you can't actually modify the references. Again, under, there's all the same caveats apply about if you have a final array, you're still going to be able to like modify the contents of that array. You just won't be able to reassign that array. Uh, but it is pretty much the same as adding the final syntax. Uh, by default, Kotlin will push you to use val. Uh, this is in order to force you to prevent issues surrounding cases where you modify your variable out from under yourself. So it's a way to sort of, you'll see IntelliJ saying, hey, you sure you didn't want to make this a val? You sure you didn't want to make this a val? Uh, but that, and so that's sort of as a convention or stylistic thing, something that we tend towards. But var is definitely something that we use in a number of cases as necessary. Uh, the other thing is type inference, which is to say that if the compiler knows what the type of your thing is, at the, at the time of assignment, you don't need to actually specify the type by doing this colon and putting a type afterwards. Uh, because the, these variables can now only be ints because we are assigning them to ints uh, at the assignment site. Now, if you wanted to, for example, have the variable A uh, make it the equivalent of an object type, so something where it could, uh, you could reassign it into a string or something like that, then you would, what you would need to do is you would need to take, uh, instead of uh, doing this here, what you would need to do is you would need to assign the variable to uh, be of type any, so have, have a colon any there. Uh, and then what you could do is you could change that to be any type you want. But by default, the compiler will type your variables. There's also a seat up front if you uh, mind, don't mind being up front. Uh, whichever. You do you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's, that's a brief overview of variables. We'll be using them a lot today, so you'll get pretty comfortable with this syntax. 
Yeah. Uh, so next, there, you also see the, the word const in some places. So the, the idea of a const is basically the equivalent of a static in Java land. So consts are things that are constant at compile times. They're evaluated at compile time, as opposed to having a, an instance of them everywhere that you go. Uh, so if you have a val within a class, uh, that val will be, you'll get a new one of those vals for every class. But if something is declared as a const, it will still, uh, you'll only get one of them, and it'll be used uh, all over the place. Uh, because of that, and because of the compile time guarantees, there are only specific places that you can put your const keywords. So for example, you cannot necessarily put a const keyword uh, within a normal, a standard class declaration. You can put it at the top of a file, much like you would as sort of your public static final whatever. Uh, and at the same time, you can also put them in object declarations. And Kurt will talk a little bit about what object declarations are uh, in the next presentation. Uh, so basically, the, the takeaway here is to, to think of const whenever you actually, whenever you have like a static constant, so a, a constant integer that you're using everywhere, uh, and you're going to need, and just be mindful that they need to end up in specific places, because sometimes you'll be like, oh yeah, I want this thing to be a const, and then you try to make it a const, and the compiler's like, nope, you can't do that, sorry, you need to, make it, need to put it in a special place. Uh, so an example of ways that uh, you can use this are you can have it be uh, you can just declare it, you can declare your constants as uh, primitives, you can declare them as strings. Uh, the other thing that you can do is much like standard Java static constants, what you can do is you can also combine types. So anytime, what you, can, anytime you can sort of uh, evaluate an expression on the right hand side at compile time because you have a bunch of constants, uh, you can combine those together and make them a separate constant later on. Uh, is that a question face, Lassia? Okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Uh, so that's generally the idea of constants. They'll, they'll come up again throughout this presentation as well. I have a yeah, sorry. Will it force you to add the const declaration if you want to declare a variable? I'll just repeat the question. Will it force you to add the const declaration if you want to declare a variable at the top of the file scope? No. Uh, you will not be forced to add that. Uh, you can if you want to, though. I'll, I'll, you'll see me looking at Gesh to make sure I don't get any of these wrongs. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, I hope I did it right. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, strings. Uh, strings have strings are everyone's favorite type uh, that are not that pretend to be primitives because they're used all over the place, but are not really primitives uh, because they are they're oftentimes collections of chars. Uh, strings have been given superpowers in Kotlin. Uh, and so the, some of the superpowers that we get are, first and foremost, much like uh, many other things, uh, we are, they're, for, they're gonna have uh, multi-line strings. So what you're able to do is, if you're familiar with Python doc strings, where you can put three, uh, three quotes and then put content within that, uh, that will work in Kotlin land. And then there's one spot up in the front left if you're looking for a table. Uh, so what you can, and we'll show an example of that. Uh, there's also, one of the really cool things is that all string literals in Kotlin are templates by default. Uh, so what that means is that if you want to say put your uh, put a variable into a string and evaluate that there, uh, you can do that, and you don't need to use any sort of special string format uh, the string format operators in order to make that happen. Uh, templates, when possible, are going to be evaluated at compile time. So if you're only using templates with constants, uh, the, that string will be able to be evaluated at compile time and then be a constant within the application. Uh, then I think we're you're going to need to grab two chairs. Uh, Oh, there's one more? We got one more spot. One more spot up in the middle for the, for the brave ones. <laughs> uh, the other thing is you'll also find that some, if that can't happen and those templates need to be evaluated at runtime, Kotlin will be smart about this under the hood and use string builders in order to actually make those, and actually, in order to actually create those strings. Oh, whoops. Uh, so a little example of what, what I mean by when I talk about string formatting is that what you can do is you can use this dollar sign, you can use this dollar sign operator within your strings. And what it will do is it will evaluate the information that is in that variable uh, in order to create that string. So this is much nicer than having to put a little plus w plus or whatever you have uh, in there. The other thing is in this first case, since our, uh, since our w is a const, that means it is static, it is available at compile time. So what Kotlin can do, yeah, or can I finish this statement and then get to that? So that means what Kotlin can do is turn this into a, understand that this means hello world at compile time as opposed to having to evaluate at runtime. So if you wanted to use a dollar symbol in the string, do you have to do escape character it? Good question. And we are going to talk about that in two slides. Uh, 
Uh, short answer, yes. And there are special things you need to be mindful of if you are using a dollar sign character within a template string. And we'll talk about all of those caveats in a couple slides. Uh, the other thing to be mindful of is that, any other questions? The other thing to be mindful of is that sometimes you're going to want to have a, an expression in order to actually get your, uh, in order to actually get what you're putting into the string. So in this case, you can't just put the dollar sign on in front of the map and say map foo because then your the compiler won't be able to understand that the foo is attached to the map. Uh, so in this case, for any of you who have done shell scripting, this will seem familiar as well as many other th many other cases. You put the dollar sign in front of everything, and you wrap the whole expression that you're con you want in angle brackets, and then you you'll be able to evaluate that whole thing. Is that a question hand or a head scratch hand? Cool. Uh, the other thing is I mentioned these this concept of multi-line strings. Uh, these exist in Kotlin land. And pretty much the thing to know about these is that they preserve all of the formatting that you put in them. So if you're putting white space anywhere, if you're putting new lines, if you're putting any sort of special characters into here, uh, Kotlin will happily put all of that information in there for you. Uh, what this means is that this is really awesome because you can create your strings according to whatever format you want. But it also means you need to be careful because anything that you're doing in order to display your string in a particular way will end up being part of the result here. Again, your uh, the syntax for evaluating variables in line is basically the same, though. And so back to our, yeah, question. Uh, Pratik, yeah. So let's say you have. Uh, oh. We can also repeat the question. Yeah. So you don't uh, have to uh, in the last statement, uh, let's say you have uh, put your statement in multiple lines. Yeah. What if like your statement is really too long and you wanted to uh, want to spread it out in multiple lines without actually having to display it in multiple lines? So, what do you do then? Gotcha. So the question is, what happens when you what you want to do is you want to say you have like a uh, 500 character name for your map variable and you want to evaluate that, but you want to put it on a separate line. Uh, I believe in that case, what you would probably do is do string concatenation. Uh, with the plus operator, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, yeah, the plus right. operator still exists. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you'd probably do like, say, it's the same thing you'd encounter in Python land. Uh, if you want to do that type of thing, you do. You have your first string, and then you're back to doing a plus uh, and concatenating your strings together. Again, the good thing is that's smart, and we'll use a string builder under the hood, and so you don't need to worry about generating a whole bunch of string objects there. Any other questions? Not a question. Um, actually, so if you, if you do that, um, because the Kotlin compiler will run before the Java compiler, it will actually concatenate your entire strings during compile time. So at runtime, it will be even just one string to Java. Isn't it's that, not even going to do a um, string builder for you. Isn't that only if it's constants? Only if you have constants? Yeah. If, if all of them are literal. Yeah. So if, if you really have a 500 um, character <laughs> long string um, and you put it on 10 lines, then that's fine. It will be just one line to Java. Uh, so lastly, our uh, very, very sharp question about what do we do about our dollar signs and the things that we need to escape. Uh, the answer there is it depends on the context that you're using it in. If you're using a standard string, so you're putting, uh, so you're just doing a normal string without any additional formatting attached to it, what you can do is you can escape it with a forward slash. And this forward slash is going to be standard issue forward slash to escape whatever you need to escape in your normal strings. Uh, if what you want to do is you want to put that into a multi-line string, you're in a little bit of a bind because what you need to do, remember, is these multi-line strings, will, whatever you throw at them, they'll happily display it. So in this case, fortunately, we do still have that, uh, that, dollar sign, uh, that dollar sign open bracket syntax. And what you need to do then is you need to put the specific string that you want evaluated with in there. So in this case, we would need to have the dollar sign open bracket syntax, and then into that we put the string literal dollar sign, which will then allow that to become a dollar sign in our own string. Uh, the good thing about this is if you're using these multi-line strings, because you can just like put whatever you want into them, you're not going to need to, like the only things you're really going to need to escape are quotation marks and dollar signs. And otherwise, you should be pretty much good to go with putting all of your emojis into there, and it will ha Kotlin will happily handle those for you. Uh, functions. Uh, functions, much like strings, have gotten superpowers. So functions no longer are tied. The biggest one is that functions are no longer tied to classes. So classes can still have functions, but functions can now exist at the top level, uh, much like you would. this in, removes the need for having specific classes as utility classes just to wrap your sets of functions here. Uh, functions, functions can also be declared inside of other functions. Uh, they can take functions as parameters, and they can return functions. 
so the big punchline here is that functions are, in many cases, just types. And we'll talk about the implications of that in a couple of presentations. And what they can do is they can be declared at the top level. Uh, so this means that there are, there are many easier ways, especially if you're in Kotlin, staying within Kotlin land, uh, to test your functions uh, and uh, untether them from, from the objects that they might have had to be tied to before. The basic syntax that you're going to see here is you're going to see the fun keyword, which indicates that you have a function. You're going to have the name of the function, uh, and then a colon and the return type of that function. And then you return whatever you want to from that function. Uh, if your function is really short and it's just an expression, so, it, so the right side of it can be evaluated uh, at sort of at the right side of it can be evaluated as one statement, then what you can do is you can make an expression function. So you can have this equals world, and you're still uh, just returning a string from this function. Uh, the cat, one sort of matter of convention that we have is that if you have a single uh, expression that can be evaluated, but that expression is a super long ternary statement, so your, your 500 line ternary statement that evaluates to a single thing, uh, as a matter of convention, if those are extending past a single line, uh, we try to use this first syntax just to make sure that's clear. That's part of the, that's part of the Kotlin style guide for Android, uh, one of the rules that we try to follow within our code base. Do uh, the other thing that you'll find is you'll find uh, these template. These templates can continue to be used. Uh, the you can use, or well, you can pass in variables as uh, strings. So syntax is basically the same as your variable declaration. And also specifically, if you're using expression functions, so this this third line item here, you can drop the return type because again, the compiler can understand the types of what you're returning, and you don't need to include it. If you don't include that, normally though, if you don't include that uh, that return type and you don't and you have a non-expression function, uh, so if you have just like a normal normal doing things function, then the compiler will interpret that as a return type of unit, which again is the the equivalent of void. So just be mindful of that. Yeah, question critique. Uh, so for these really straightforward one-line expression functions. Does Kotlin have the capability of inlining such kind of functions? Uh, yes, inline functions are a thing. Uh, so they, by default, it will not necessarily the function itself will not get inlined. But we'll talk about in the concept of inline functions in a couple of presentations. Uh, lastly, classes and interfaces. Although functions have been untethered from classes, this is still an object-oriented language. Uh, you can put uh, same rules pretty much apply as in Java land for all of this stuff. You can put, you can have a, we try to have a single uh, class or an interface per file, although if you wanted to, you could put a whole bunch of classes and interfaces in your files. Uh, final is going to be the default. Uh, this is something that we, probably, we saw with variable declarations, but by and large, uh, Kotlin tries to push you towards this idea of forcing you to design for inheritance and otherwise prohibiting it. Uh, if so, by default, classes will be final, which means you can't extend them. Uh, at the same time, you might find yourself saying, hey, I really designed for my inheritance, and dang it, I want my inheritance. Uh, in that case, what you can do is you can use the open keyword in order to make sure that your classes can be subclassed. Uh, the other thing you're going to want to do is the, you, you need to add the open keyword to things within that class that can be overridden. And now the override keyword exists on functions. And uh, whereas before what we sort of had a lint check, what it would do is it would make cases where you don't have the override annotation, you can make that fail. Uh, now if you don't have the override annotation on something that you're override, that will be a compile time error. So you're forced to say this is a function that I'm overriding from my base class uh, in order to be sure that you're actually overriding the right function from your base class. Uh, by default, this is another slight difference from Java land, is that uh, public is going to be your default visibility from all of your methods uh, and all of your variables. Uh, what this means is that you're going to need to be cognizant of if you want to hide any implementation details. The other thing that has been added is this internal keyword. So internal, so package private, so package private has gone away in Kotlin land, uh, although I don't know who used package private all that much before anyway. Uh, and it has been replaced with internal. Internal now uh, is a little bit Confusing, but basically what it means is that uh, everything that is compiled with one invocation of Kotlin C, the Kotlin compiler, has access to all the other internal things uh, that, are, that are compiled within that same invocation of Kotlin C. So what this does is this prevents cases where before with the package private modifier, someone could go and create your package in their application and then get access to all your package private stuff. Uh, now, since those are different runs of the Kotlin compiler, those two sets of code will not have access to each other, so there's much safer protections between them. Uh, 
Uh, there's also no new, new keyword when you're creating your classes. So just be on the lookout for that. If I know I accidentally sometimes type the new keyword, and I'm like, oh yeah, thanks for reminding me that that's not legal in IntelliJ. Uh, so quick rundown is your, many of these things are going to be familiar. Interfaces, uh, methods are going to be open by default, so we don't need to put the open keyword on there. Again, we have our function run. It isn't going to specify a return type. That means that its return type is unit. Uh, we can have interfaces which extend interfaces. So in this case, what we've done is we have our repeating runnable, which extends our runnable class. Uh, the cool thing to note here is that our interface can have default implementations. So for those of you who keep up on the latest and greatest in Java land, which we don't necessarily have access to in Android, then you'll know that this came as part of Java 8 is that you can specify how a particular function runs by default. And this is a feature that Kotlin provides for us. So in this case, what we have, happen, what we're, what we have happening is that the run, someone will still need to specify the, what the run function does. But once, if they have this repeating runnable function, then, they, then the option to run that runnable uh, will exist right out, the, right out of the box. Uh, we can have our greeting class. So uh, this is a class that's open. So what we say is uh, we have a greeting class. It extends the runnable class. So again, that colon to indicate typing information. Uh, since we are overriding the specific run function, we have to put the override, run func the override keyword in, fun in front of our run function. And then what we can do is we can tie this all together to have a repeating greeting, uh, which is now closed because we don't have the open keyword on it. And what that will do is that will extends the greeting class, and now it implements repeating runnable. Uh, so what we've done here is now we have a repeating runnable that has implemented the run function. And the repeating runnable interface specifies a way for us to run something multiple times. So now our repeating greeting can call that version of the run function that takes in an integer. And then that will, in turn, call the run function that we specified in the greeting class. Uh, so that's all I got for this initial section. Does anyone have any questions? about anything here before we jump into basics. Yeah, so previous slide? Yeah, you got it. Oh, I can go back way more than the previous slide as well. Did anything about like the number of classes you can extend versus like interfaces change? Uh, still single inheritance model. Uh, interfaces are go crazy with your interfaces. Uh, one interesting, one little thing to note here uh, is that, or that I forgot to point out, I'm sure we'll talk about more as we talk about classes, is this thing right here. You'll notice that when you extend, the, when you extend another class, you'll have to put these parentheses uh, for the default constructor there. Um, one other thing is that you can use composition with multiple things, but um, there's a special delegation. We're not really covering it here because it's quite of a deep topic, but there's some of the bonus tasks in the coding if you're I've done a bit faster, you can do that on your own. If you can provide a default uh, implementation for your methods and interfaces, uh, how is that different from just creating an open class with a with a function and extending that class? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So you're, the question the question there is like basically why, if I can provide default implementations, like why would I, why don't I just create a class and provide that? Uh, I think the, the short answer there is the, the idea of multiple inheritance, because you, again, only will have single inheritance here. This type of, way, this type of uh, functionality allows you to compose things with multiple default implementations. Uh, I also, I'm sure there's like a whole bunch of literature on this when Java 8 introduced this about how to do this, how not to do this. Uh, but the biggest thing there that comes to mind immediately is this uh, ability to compose sort of very simple functions. You're also uh, in, order, in order to accomplish tasks that you would otherwise have to do through inheritance. Because mm -hmm. you can extend multiple, implement multiple interfaces. Yeah, and you also like most, most of the times interfaces, you you can't actually, you don't have enough information to actually implement them. This is just a special case where you, you do have enough information to actually provide a, um, a default implementation. But like for the runnable, um, yeah, you can, how do you provide a default implementation of a run method? Like you can do whatever you want. That's the, part, that's the point of the class, right? Any other questions? It might be a bit early for this, but yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Do the interfaces allow for generics? Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, generics, more to come soon. Wait, just wait until the discussion of covariance and contravariance. I don't know if we cover that, because I always mix it up. Everybody gets it right, so yeah. that's fine. Only Christina Lee. 
And I don't even know if she does. She just, she just has the presentations that are always right. Cool. Uh, so we'll jump in. Uh, we're going to jump into setting uh, a quick demo of setting up a project. Uh, and then we'll be around for questions as we go through these, uh, the, as we, everyone goes through that process. Uh, if there's anything else that you're scared to raise your hand or comes up as, we are, uh, as we're running through that. So the, oh man, I'm so far away now. So the, if I recall, the exercise for this was basically to get set up, uh, basically hello world, a Kotlin application. So if you look, uh, your Kotlin application is going to be fairly, uh, setting up a Kotlin activity will be fairly similar to setting up a Java activity. What? Did I check out everything? No, no, have they checked out? Oh, have you checked out everything? I'll, I'll run through this and then make sure that everyone has checked out stuff. No, so um, don't worry about checking out anything now. This is part of your exercise, so it's fine. Just follow along with uh, what Mars is doing, and you'll do it on your own afterwards. Yeah. So what we're doing here is we're just creating an empty activity, our main activity. Uh, now, if you notice that when you uh, use this dialog frequently, you'll notice that you have the two options here. Uh, and then what we can do is we just generate our standard issue activity. Does it work? See, I told you. I told Gash this wasn't going to work. Uh, during the dry run, this failed Close before. The Close the business repo. So uh, the cluster is currently open. It's, yeah. it's All right. I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you one more try of this. We actually prepared for the failures of the live demo yesterday. Yeah, man, didn't work. Uh, okay. So what we're going to do is we are going to actually do this live. Uh, basically. I know, I'm taking the layout from the, from the next one. Because that's what you told me to do, man. People don't need to see me write XML. <laughs> they, they know how to write XML. Uh, so if this fails, what you will do is we will see how to uh, recreate uh, a layout resource file. And we'll just create our activity main here. Uh, uh, and then we will, what we will do is we will uh, create a new Java class. First, what we'll do is we create a new package, uh, which is going to be com. Dot, what is the package name? My.demo. My .demo. There we go. Now I can link. Yeah. Uh, Java class. No. Package. I always forget how, how hard this is to do. My.demo.app. And then we have a Java class with main. Java training class. Oh, whoops. Sorry. <laughs> This is what happens when you, uh, so we're going to open up our main activity. Uh, again, our classes are going to be closed by default. And so what we're going to do is now, if we look, what we're going to need is we're going to need to app compat activity. And again, if you look, you'll notice that we have uh, this, oh, these no, this no argument constructor because that's the constructor of app compat activity that we're using as a default. Uh, again, we're going to override our on create method. Uh, you'll notice here this question mark operator, which is a, or this question mark syntax, which is a little different. Kurt will cover that soon. Uh, again, it's worth noting we have the override function on our on create, uh, and then what we have is we will jump back here. Get out of here, theme. I don't know how any of you work because we don't have the right. I don't want to bother setting that up. Yeah, get out of here. Uh, Uh, so, this. I don't know your hotkeys, man. Uh, so we just create the. Uh, we create our. Uh, we create our standard issue layout file. And then, uh, if you notice, we're not going to have any semicolons here. And then the cool thing that we can do is, do we have KTX in here? Uh, uh, so what you see is we can get the, what we can do is uh, there are these Kotlin extensions that happen in Android land, which mean that you no longer need to have find view by ID. Uh, what's happening here is we're automatically getting the, the hello world variable out of that uh, layout file that we created. And then what we can do is we can just set that text to be hello world. Uh, what are you yelling me about here? Oh, you probably want to. Oh, yeah, other thing there. Uh, so no, most, all of your setters will become, basically, Kurt will talk about this before, but or later, what you're going to have is you're no longer going to have to call these set methods. You're just going to be changing properties directly. 
Uh, let's see if it works. Not that one. Oh, no, I did it wrong. Why do we got to have so many apps in here, man? Oh, I didn't set it as a launcher activity. This is what happens when you need, when you don't remember how to actually write Android and you just know how to write Yelp Android code. Uh, so we build it. I'm going to give the spoiler alert once this works. I don't want to spoiler alert and say it works, but cause I don't know if it does. Uh, so I think the, the big takeaways for this are, uh, oh, no, hello. That isn't working. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, uh, we're, worth keeping an eye out for this, uh, this type. You'll see this syntax where it's like, oh, we have this hello world variable. Where did that come from? Uh, it's automatically pulling that out of the layout file. And you'll also find yourself using fewer setters as uh, basically no setters for your interoperability there, uh, assuming that the API is conformed to a specific uh, contracts. Uh, so yeah, so we have a hello world. It works. Uh, so now uh, we'll jump to the workbook, and the workbook should have basically the exercises getting this hello world application up and running. And then if you have any questions, we will all be around. Just raise your hand and holler, and we will be happy to help you. Thank you very much, friends. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Hey. <laughs> I'm going to turn my microphone off now. <laughs>